Hello, I'm Dr. Malcolm Glover and welcome to Healing the Divide, where we reach for open dialogue and common ground in these socially turbulent times. We focus this edition on a new generation of activists because the concerns of young people matter, especially during times of great economic uncertainty and social instability. This program continues important conversations about injustice and inequality from the perspective of young change agents who are making a difference. We will discuss community concerns and explore the need for reform and reconciliation in Arkansas and across America. Our powerhouse panel includes Emma Davis, a college student and activist, Kendra Collins, an attorney and community builder, Detective Kendall Harper of the Little Rock Police Department, Drika Wrights, the co-founder of the movement, and Irvin Camacho, an immigrant rights advocate. And there will never be a better time for this conversation because our country is at a crossroads. Research shows young adults are earning less in income and have more debt. They're not doing as well socially or economically as their parents were at the same age. The COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic is limiting educational opportunities and job prospects for the next generation. And the killings of unarmed black Americans and the treatment of undocumented immigrants at our borders show that there are major concerns about policing as it relates to our courts and the criminal justice system. We're going to deal with all of those because we recognize that systemic racism exists and personal biases exist and they have to be addressed. So let's get to the conversation. And I think one of the easiest ways to do that is start off by talking about what it means to be an activist. Because there are many ways that you can stand up and be counted and speak out against injustices. Let's start with you, Drika. What does activism mean to you? So if we think about the root word of activism, it's to act. So to me, activism is acting and being a participant in bringing forth change. So personally, I'm an artist. I teach poetry and creative writing, and I use my art to participate in activism by teaching at-risk youth, especially how to use art as a way to increase their comprehension skills, communication skills, and to teach them how to use it as a coping mechanism. Um, it's always been my desire to be able to help educate a child on how to govern themselves on an internal level so that they can go out and be strong and show up in the world as a, you know, just a great individual who also brings forth change. Irvin, what about you, activism? What does it mean? For me, it means a lot of things. Of course, the root of, of it for me is to be active. Um, I specifically work with immigrant communities in Northwest Arkansas. Um, so activism is also empowering people, empowering them to know how to vote, you know, and when to register to vote, but also for them to know their rights, um, to make sure that they're protected in case any situation uh, comes up, whether it being with police or whether it being with ICE, uh, different situations like that. Um, so I definitely think that it does root from trying to make society, the world, our country, our state, our city, a better place. Um, activism does. Kendra. To me, activism really is about centering the needs of humanity. And so an activist is a person who has a vision of the kind of world that they want to live in, and that's a more just, more equitable, more loving world. But it's also doing the work on a daily basis. Uh, in my life, most of my work is in the criminal justice field. So I work as a public defender and I also serve on the governor's task force. So working at the policy level is also important. Uh, when people think about activism though, I, I think they think about the greats, the heroic individuals, the Martin Luther Kings and the uh, Malcolm X's, but it's also about the everyday activism that people can do in their lives. As a student at the University of Central Arkansas, I'm constantly surrounded by organizations on campus uh, from people with different cultural and uh, racial backgrounds and I'm also constantly learning and so to me um, being a student activist is learning, learning new things about who I am as a black person, um, learning things about uh, issues that affect the Latinx community, the indigenous communities and it's also helping others educate on a lot of the uh, institutionalized racism that's going on in America and it's not so much as just providing them with material 
um, but it's also helping people get into the mindset of learning and being able to accept um, what's happening in America. Kendall? It's simple for me, it's just, it's just actively making my impact. Uh, so in my field, I'm a detective for Little Rock Police Department, and especially now, the problem is there's a huge gap in the bridge between police and community. So my part in active, as, as an activism right now is to reach out, have those relationships. You know, I didn't know Drika before all this happened, but, uh, you know, getting out of the car, having these conversations, letting people know that you're human, know that you care, um, and just impacting my world. Uh, my small little world, if, if we can impact our small little worlds as far as my friends, my families, my coworkers, internally with the police department, whatever changes I can make, that's me being active. Uh, so like he said, it doesn't take, you know, you don't, we don't have to be Dr. Martin Luther King or, or Malcolm X, but long as you do your part and stay active in your impact, then you're, you're an activist. One of the things I want us to do is take some time to discuss how activists raise awareness and keep the momentum going for the causes that they care about. Uh, but first, let's hear from local community builder, Dr. Philip Fletcher, the founder of the City of Hope Outreach in Conway. One of his goals is to stimulate honest discussions on what it means to be human in a difficult world. Let's hear his take on the steps necessary to sustain social movements and solve persistent problems. Hello, everybody. 2020 has given us an opportunity to confront many difficulties. From the coronavirus to issues of race, we as Arkansans have the opportunity to support and improve the lives of one another. Race is a very difficult topic for many to discuss, but the opportunity for us to sit down at the table together to figure out ways to sustain change so that we can support the dignity of one another is vitally important. How can we do that? Well, one, it is recognizing the human dignity and worth of every individual, regardless of skin color. Two, it's the recognition that we should approach one another in love, to listen to one another, to hear one another's story, and then find out ways to act. But thirdly, it requires us to remember that we should approach one another as individuals and not as a group. Four, it is remembering to judge one another on the basis of our character and integrity and not on the basis of our skin color. Five, we need to recognize that we cannot do this alone, that we need our black brothers and sisters, our white brothers and sisters, our Latino brothers and sisters, our Asian brothers and sisters, all of us to come together around the table and to figure out ways that we can improve the lives of one another. And finally, to sustain change, it begins with one-on-one -on -one personal relationships, reaching out to those existing relationships that you have already in order to stimulate change. We can do this as we continue to heal the divide in Arkansas and America. Dr. Fletcher raises some interesting points and Irvin, I'm wondering, is there something else that you'd like to add to that, particularly when we recognize that sometimes the people that uh, activists advocate for or fight for may not necessarily have grown up in the United States, may not necessarily speak the language, but they still need an advocate. Yeah, for me, I think the most important um, thing is like listening to folks, you know, um, in our immigrant community specifically, everyone has such a diverse, uh, interesting and personal story. And a lot of the times these stories do influence and change the hearts of a lot of people that were against us. You know, in the, in the past years, I've seen so many folks who uh, will talk about, you know, their journey to America. Um, the fact that they didn't have a, a driver's license like, like normal uh, teens did uh, whenever they would graduate high school. Seeing them struggle having to pay uh, triple tuition that a citizen pays to go to, to college. So all of these stories make an impact whenever they're told and it's difficult and I don't I don't want to I don't want to say that like everyone has to say their story but I do want to say that when those stories are said I've seen that hearts change and that it does cause some sort of change in our society when people understand that sometimes they're put in circumstances that are out of their control. Emma, one of the things uh, that constantly comes up when I was preparing for this program is uh, Young people, particularly those in Generation Z, and interestingly enough, Generation Alpha, uh, some of those who are in elementary school and all the rest right now, one of the things they say is that 
they're concerned about so many of these issues, uh, but they also feel like adults don't always necessarily listen to them or give them a seat at the table so that they can express themselves and then bring about change. What are some of the things you're hearing and how can those voices be heard more? Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, a lot of the younger generation, like even myself included, thinks that uh, sometimes adults, um, the older generations kind of look down on us and say, well, you're just being uh, naive. You know, I remember when I was your age and I was all like crazy doing all these stuff. But really what it comes down to is this gap that we're, we're dealing with is so deep that it does affect how generations interact with inter one another. And I think that in order to um, truly heal, there has to be a conversation. There has to be a time where um, older people j just need to sit back and listen to young people. Some of the things that we're experiencing um, and some of the traumas that we're going through, we're not necessarily seen back in, I guess you could say, the day. And so having time and uh, having generations listen to one another and say, you know, maybe this is a valid issue. Maybe this, um, this is something we need to look into. Because if we ignore it now, 10, 20, even 50 years down the road, when it comes up again, we're not gonna have a way to deal with it properly. 2020, 2020 has been a lightning rod. We were all talking about it uh, before. And particularly when it comes to issues of um, racial inequality and injustice. George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, just to name a few. And as we sit, we know that there are protests that are happening across the country as it relates to the Breonna Taylor case. This young woman, 26 years old, uh, an emergency medical technician, someone who we consider now during the pandemic an essential worker who was killed um, in her home because police used a uh, no-knock warrant, entered her home, uh, killed her, firing uh, uh, into the home. And interestingly enough, it turns out that the people that they were looking for were already in police custody and they were at the wrong house. And now it turns out that uh, both prosecutors and the grand jury have decided uh, to not charge those three police officers with Breonna Taylor's uh, killing. Drika, when you heard what was happening, uh, and the result uh, of that case. What did you think of? First off, I would like to say I'm 26 right now. So to know that another black lady who was 26 lost her life in that way is such a devasta devastating thought. Like it was really painful when I was watching the live of the um, decision that they made. It just made me sad, you know, the. The most I can say is that it's really tragic that that's happened and that people are being allowed to just get away with something so atrocious. So it really bothers me on a deep level and I'm just really sympathetic and, you know, my heart really goes out to the family, you know, because this situation, it really touched me in a deep way again because I'm 26, you know, that could have been me. So we have thoughts like that and that's, for black people, I feel like we live in a time that's so traumatizing. Like, we are literally, we, we take in things subconsciously that people don't even have to think twice about. Like, the things that we take in, it's a lot. You know, when we go into spaces, you know, I, I'm usually in spaces where I'm the only black person. And you know, not that it should be uncomfortable, but it is because I'm having all these other thoughts. You know, so just going back to the situation again for a black, 26 year old to lose her life. You're absolutely right. And I think it's important for us to note that there was one officer who faces criminal charges, but not for Brianna's killing, right. um, just because uh, he endangered others' lives when he shot into right. her apartment and some of those bullets went into neighboring apartments. Uh, as a law enforcement officer, uh, Kendall, as a, as a detective, uh, I know that you wear the badge, but you also understand the community. You come from the community. What kind of conversations have you had and, and how do you make people realize that you may not be like others? I'm just me. Um, I try to remove myself from the badge and the gun and I try to make people see me as Kendall. I'm human, uh, I have emotions, you know what I mean? And as, as far as going back to the Breonna Taylor incident, 
just because I'm a law enforcement officer doesn't mean that I don't have those same raw emotions that Drika has. And, and my emotions was first fear, second concern. First of all, it's fear because how, how, how are we getting to this point? It's like it's getting worse. It's like no change is, is coming. Um, and the concern is, where do we go from here? Because we just went through this whole ordeal with the George Floyd incident, and we're talking about a nationwide movement, um, a nationwide movement of young, old, white, black, all races and creeds coming together, trying to let their voice be heard. And then here we are in another situation to where it's kind of like the voices aren't being heard. So it's fear because we don't know where we're going. And as far as a law enforcement officer, uh, all I can do is do my part. Um, as far as the grand jury, as you know, Kendrell, there's levels to it. You know, you got the police side of it and you got the court side of it. So as long as I do my part genuinely with a pure heart on my part, all I can do is pass the torch and hope for the best. And the problem is the torch is being blown out on the pass. And that's where we need to, to hone in on is why is this torch getting blown out and the fire is not staying lit till the end to get justice for people. And, and I think that's where, we're, where we are right now. Um, mm -hmm. Kendrell, I'm wondering if you can chime in. I know you're a member of that governor's law enforcement task force, but just in terms of your work as a public defender, uh, what are you hearing about reforming or reimagining policing? What's coming before you? Well, first of all, to, to go to the Breonna Taylor situation, I, I, a response that I hear pretty often is, well, you know, this is going to keep happening until people's hearts and minds change. But the issue is we've been waiting for that for a real long time. And I think what you're seeing from people of my generation and younger is that we, we don't want to wait on that. But, but I think what's more important then the individual level is the systemic level. And there are some real systemic problems. How do we get to the point that the Breonna Taylor even happened? And so you have to say, well, what are the policy decisions? I remember Dr. King uh, saying that even though the law can't make a man love me, it can make him stop lynching me, and that's important. So we begin to change the policies. Well, a police department should change its policies, and even though uh, a no-knock warrant entry may be legal, uh, it's not moral and it's not safe. There, there are safer ways to execute that uh, a warrant in that situation, especially when we're talking about a, non, a nonviolent drug offense. And so if we change the policy, then maybe we have somebody like Breonna Taylor who gets to live. Or if we reimagine the way we think about policing, and uh, obviously you know there are tasks that uh, police officers have to face that they're not necessarily equipped to face. And it, it's, it's too much on the officer. And one example is mental health. And you have people who have, are dealing with mental health crises, and we need people who are trained to go into those situations. And maybe somebody like uh, Mr. Daniel Prude in New York uh, also gets to live. If we change policies, um, eliminate chokeholds and, and neck restraints, then maybe somebody like Mr. George Floyd gets to live. I think those simple policy uh, decisions are important, but also thinking larger systemically about how we approach uh, law enforcement and also the criminal justice system as a whole. Absolutely. Um, we're going to talk more about that as well. Just some of the different perspectives from local law enforcement to immigration and customs enforcement and the views from classrooms to community about that. But first, advocating for fundamental change is not easy and many young activists from around the state often feel frustrated when they see our political and legal systems moving with all deliberate speed to address issues that require immediate action. In this segment from the new Arkansas PBS digital series titled The Glow, we see how activism can also inspire creativity. That we could put out an album of poetry and just show that spoken word isn't just boring. And it isn't, and it isn't something that that old white guys do that you read about in class. Like it's entertaining, entertaining and powerful. Right, entertaining time. and powerful. Exactly. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> Dope. And I'm guessing by the last name and the cur hair curl pattern that y'all related, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. my little sister, <laughs> for sure. my big brother. For sure, for sure. <laughs> so I've been kind of following y'all for a while, and especially in this time, being after post George Floyd's murder, and y'all being activists on front lines. Do you feel that your creativity? 
has to be shown in other forms in terms of protest or, or advocacy? Yes, I feel like it's, it's very important to, to do anything because just doing nothing, I, that just doesn't sit right with me. So I feel like what, what, what's more important to be doing than any type of protest? Like, what, what could I possibly be doing? Just chilling at home, playing a game, eating something? Like, I, I should be out here trying to make the country better for the future, trying to, make, trying to make change happen. So I feel like it's very important to do anything, whether that's handing out water bottles. You don't necessarily have to march. You can hand out the water bottles. You can make masks for, for our protesters to wear. You can do, you can do anything. There's so many different uh, avenues you could take uh, to help the fight. And for me, I feel like just being a black girl is kind of in my essence. And I've always kind of tried to be an example for people that this is what a smart black girl looks like. This is what a creative black girl looks like. This is what a confident black girl looks like. So yes, with my words, yes, with my performances and the way that I speak at these things, that is how I've chosen to use my voice in this movement, but also just by being an example and showing other brown skinned girls that you can look like me and not have these horrible stereotypical, you know, words associated with you, or you can be more than what they expect out of you. So I've always been kind of humbled at the fact that I can inspire other people who look like me to show them that there's so much greatness just in who you are. And that's what I try to live my day by. We're not just speaking for ourselves. We are the voice for those who feel like they don't have a voice. So whenever I go up and do a poem in front of in front of hundreds, in front of thousands of people, and everybody can resonate with it, that's that's powerful. That's 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 a purpose. That's something that's that's for the greater good of everybody. Look around and I'm still here, I celebrate, 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 celebrate what a brother done done, celebrate what we about to come from, celebrate those that love to hate mark upon their face, but they ain't about none, I celebrate. Special thanks to Jamie McAdoo, Norrell McAdoo, and Epiphany Big Piff Morrow for their contributions to that piece. And panelists, let's talk more about the important connections that exist between art and activism. And of course, I'm looking right at you, Drika, because I know that's your wheelhouse. So I'm actually working on an initiative called Quotivate, um, because I don't know if you all have ever heard of Hank Willis Thomas, but he's an artist and he had an exhibit up called All Things Being Equal. And with that exhibit, his biggest message he was trying to convey is that what we consume with our ears and our eyes affects how we feel about ourselves and how we behave in life. And I remember when I was in 10th grade, there's this nicely decorated poster and on it, it said, excuses stop at the door. And that has always stuck with me. So I've never allowed myself to make excuses. And because of it, because that one statement, that one artistic piece that was on a wall in 10th grade, and I'm 26 now, because it stuck with me, I've been able to accomplish so many great things in life. Right now, I'm the arts and education program manager for the state of Arkansas. You know, I'll be the, I'm the youngest community advisory board member on the Little Rock School District. I'm running for the Little Rock School District School Board unopposed, and I'll be the youngest member then. I'm the first to graduate high school and to go to college in my family, but because that statement stuck with me, because it, it was planted in my mind. It has allowed me to carry myself through a lot of tough situations. And I said that to say this with the initiative that I'm working on, Quotivate, um, basically what will happen is throughout the city of Little Rock, we'll have murals put up with quotes and decals on businesses where, you know, when people are randomly walking, you see something that's motivational. Matter of fact, I went to a business meeting the other day and somebody posted a post-it note on a meter and it just said, you know, be not led by fear. And you know, people need those little pick-me-ups. Like we need art, we need things that are scattered, you know, that just feed our minds subconsciously so that we take it in etern internally and we think, feel, and behave in a better way. So sure. art is very, very important in activism because it feeds our subconscious mind. And Emma, that creativity even moves beyond art because now what a lot of pe young people are doing is they're using the internet and social media and all the rest to come together to address some of these issues. Can you talk about how you've used uh, online uh, opportunities to rally support for the causes you care about? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that uh, Gen Z is 
notoriously known for is always being on social media. And um, actually, one of my friends, uh, Layla Holloway, uh, we came together and we created a uh, protest demonstration in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And uh, we did that over social media. We did that by using Facebook. And um, another thing that is done is that like a lot of people you will take their art to uh, social media platforms such as TikTok to spread awareness about um, the issues that are affecting their community. I can't tell you how many times I have seen people um, from who are indigenous, especially who would um, talk about all the issues that are affecting their community, how uh, black transgender women would come forth and talk about um, issues that are affecting black transgender women in America. And to me, like that is, a, that's a, an, an experience, that's a, a way for people to get educated and to um, take part in the movement. Even though there are creative outlets for young and old activists, uh, we are living through a pandemic. And as you work with different grassroots groups um, and advocate for different groups of people, what have been some of the drawbacks to some of your efforts during this pandemic? Has it been difficult? And what creative ways are you coming up with to still make sure that people's voices are getting heard? I think one of the important things to point out, um, in Northwest Arkansas, we have a lot of people, specifically Latinx folks and Marshallese folks who are Pacific Islanders, working in the poultry factories. Um, and what has happened is that a lot of folks within those two communities have lost family members, community members, because of the virus. So um, if you look at the numbers of folks who have passed away over there, like the majority of them are Marshallese or they're Latinx folks. And um, this roots from working within the poultry industry <clears throat> and at the same time, maybe not having the protections that they should have, right? Um, so what, what happens is that that causes fear within our communities and folks don't want to go out, folks don't want to do extra things, don't want to be part of community events simply because of the fear. Um, so what we do is try to make sure that if we do have a community event, um, there was several uh, George Floyd protests over there and there, there's been protests for the Latinx community as well, uh, for Vanessa Guillen who was the uh, Fort Hood soldier that was murdered on the base. And uh, when we had those events, you know, we, we reminded people that, that they should wear their face masks. We had uh, hand sanitizer and other uh, precautionary measures to make sure that people feel safe coming out and supporting movements during this pandemic. But we do know that folks, specifically older folks, uh, don't feel safe um, simply because they don't want to go out and risk and then bring the um, virus home. Um, so we completely understand that, but we've been able to work around that just by informing people through social media like Emma and just let them know that we're going to make sure that they're safe and uh, it's optional if they want to come out or not to support these movements. Kendall, I'm wondering if we continue thinking about creativity, one of the things that I thought was interesting before uh, in our conversation is how you serve as a bridge builder. Mm -hmm. You understand both the perspective of law enforcement, but also the perspective of people who feel marginalized within the community. And so what kind of creative solutions have you come up with to continue to make sure that people understand each other? Well, I think the first thing is you gotta, you gotta create the space or the environment. Uh, so the way that I do that is through my, my fitness business. So uh, I do an outdoor boot camp fitness business and we have good conversations within that that hour that we're together. And also just using my platform as far as my Instagram and my, my Facebook, I send out motivational quotes every day. Um, I send that to my group every day, just to kind of put out that positive energy. Um, and fitness, man, it, it, it plays as a therapy for some people. You can have the worst day. I can have the worst day uh, at work, the longest day at work, but once I get home, kind of get myself together and get to, to session, all that stuff is gone. And I've had several clients say, man, I just really appreciate this hour that you gave me. Um, and just laugh and having a good time. And at the same time, when all this stuff was going on, having those conversations, uh, having those conversations with people. And like I said before, humanizing myself. I'm a human at the end of the day. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's my career that I chose. Uh, but listen, you can talk to me. So I just try to make sure that I'm approachable uh, to people that don't know me. 
um, in any any aspect as far as fitness or as far as law enforcement because I mean everybody knows that around here it's not I know you a, I know you shared with all of us earlier your kind of quote for today yeah uh, embrace turbulence to embrace and, turbulence and, and, and yeah. tell, tell us more about that what was what does that mean to you? so basically what it is is all of us traveled we've traveled before and uh, you're on your flight and you hit tur turbulence or rough air is what they call it and in the midst of that turbulence you you have a sense of fear you have a sense of doubt you have a sense of uncertainty but once you come out of that turbulence and you finally get to your destination it makes you appreciate you getting to your destination even more safely life is the same exact way in my opinion uh we hit rough air and those bumps those bruises those fears those those uh uncertainties those doubts that you are or won't accomplish those goals that you set for yourself once you finally get to the other side of the turbulence and actually do it it makes you appreciate it even more and with what's going on in our world right now this is just rough air it's turbulence okay and once we get to the other side of this turbulence we're going to appreciate what we had to go through to get here mm -hmm. um so and it's necessary i think it's necessary and it's getting bumpy it's getting bumpy it's getting rough and like you said it's getting uncertain um, but I have no doubt that we will make it to the other side of all this stuff in the end, and we will appreciate that destination that we finally make it to, which will be a much more loving, peaceful, happy uh, America, and that's what we need. Kendrell, to get to the other side, it's gonna take some hard work. Uh, and as a writer, but also as an attorney, uh, you've kind of had to deal with some of these weighty issues in a variety of different ways. Uh, what do you see as the way forward, whether it's in your interactions with clients or serving on these task force or even in those personal moments when you're just writing down personal thoughts? How do we move ahead? Yeah, I, I wish I had the, the answer for that question. Uh, but what I do know is that confrontation is key in, in dealing with these issues head on. I really appreciate the, the title of this conversation, Healing the Divide, because when I think about race and racism in America, it really is our oldest wound. And in a lot of ways, we have never taken the time as a country to nurture and to deal with that wound. And it's, it's begun to infect all areas of our society. And being in rooms, uh, you mentioned the task force earlier, I'll be frank, at the beginning of when it all first started back in June, there was a lot of distance, a lot of tension, because what you have is people uh, really fearful, like uh, Kendall said, people are afraid. And they're afraid because we fear the unknown and we really don't know each other when it comes to specifically uh, white people and black people in America. Uh, the black community and police officers, we don't know each other. And so we had to get past that um, that initial not knowing each other and, and begin to engage in dialogue and share our stories. And you hear my pain and I hear your pain and actually listen instead of talking at each other. And when we began to do that, we we actually realized that there's a lot that we can agree on. Of course, we do disagree on a lot, but the things, the core things, uh, having a, 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 a more just and more equitable equitable society that we are in agreement on. And when we stick to those core values uh, as our starting point, we're able to get to some solutions. And I think like that conversation is important because uh, people feel like they got to choose sides. And, and as uh, the son of a police officer and a black man, uh, and, and Mr. Harper is aware of this as well, you have to deal with two different identities. And those don't have to be separate. You can understand the uh, sacrifices of law enforcement on one side, but also the history that we have uh, between law enforcement and the black community. And being able to confront those things is important. One of the things I'm hearing is to move ahead. We have to be inspired, we have to listen to one another, we have to think outside of the box, but we have to be willing to have a conversation and come together. And up next, we broaden this conversation with Jimmy Warren from the Ark and Talk podcast. He talks with Arkansans from Fort Smith, Fayetteville, Searcy, about their efforts to speak out against injustice. And he takes a closer look at a new hate crimes legislation uh, in the state.
Thank you. This is Jimmy Warren. We are here with Healing the Divide, and this is a virtual session. We have Dr. Engel. He is a uh, professor at an Arkansas institution. We also have Representative Nicole Clowney. She is in the Fedville area, and also UCA student, Miss Layla Holloway. Thank you all for joining us on this panel today. So Layla, I just kind of want to start with you being there at the University of Central Arkansas and just representing the uh, Gen Zers that are there. How is Gen Z as a whole feeling about all that's going on currently? I think Gen Z is kind of torn right now. As a generation, I feel like we've been alive solely through trauma. I mean, some of us, we were born during all of these wars. Um, I was born like seven months before. So, you know, We've had a lifetime of just political trauma, social trauma, um, and I think we're a little bit fed up. And so I think that's partially where you're seeing all these protests, where you're seeing these demonstrations, because we're very fed up with the life that we've, you know, the world that we've grown up in. Can you talk about the protests that you had there in uh, Fort Smith? Kind of, were there any certain circumstances that started that? Well, I think the protest is as Gen Z as it gets. So Emma Davis and I, after the murder of George Floyd, we're on Facebook um, and we had commented on each other's posts and I said, yeah, I'm about ready to go protest. And she said, me too. So I created a Facebook event and I mean, it was two days prior to the actual protest. And for some reason, 500 people showed up and showed their support and love and you know, honor for the life of George Floyd. So it's as Gen Z as it gets, social media yeah. rallying us together. Awesome. Awesome. Representative Clowney, um, I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw a couple of weeks ago up in your area of Fedville that there were several, um, for lack of better words, just a vandalism attack where white supremacist groups were spray painting naughty messages and things. Can you talk about that experience? Maybe six or eight weeks ago, there was a side of a building on you know the main thoroughfare through South Fayetteville, MLK. Um, and it was white supremacist um, language and, and imagery. And a local artist covered it up. Um, she got donations from the community and she's a sign painter and she went and she covered, a giant, she covered it up with a giant mural that said, love unites us. Um, last week, the mural was vandalized. Um, the portion that said unites was covered so that it now says love weakens us. And there were really graphic and, and um, just horrifying white supremacist um, uh, slogans tagged in on the side of the building. So, you know, this is sort of a struggle that we're having right now um, in Fayetteville and I know in so many parts of the country um, where these folks who used to hide in the shadows, um, where the racism used to be quieter, just as, just as violent, but quieter, um, is now, you know, those people are now feeling emboldened. And this was just a very um, tangible and visible reminder of the fact that we are moving um, in the wrong direction. Do you, I want to go to Dr. Engel real quick. And as Representative Clowney um, and Ms. Holloway talked about things that were more recent, my understanding is that you have um, experiences that you can share from the past and not just from the shadows, you actually saw firsthand or have a firsthand of account of an interaction in Mississippi with the Ku Klux Klan. That year that I graduated high school, uh, a group of uh, people from outside uh, the state largely came to Tupelo and decided that they were going to make our city the, uh, the headquarters of uh, the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, so the whole year that I was uh, graduating my senior year of high school, uh, every weekend there were uh, marches uh, by the, the Klan and then opposing marches by uh, a, a black group. And they were usually timed to coincide so that um, they would meet somewhere on their routes and get into shouting and spitting matches and uh, a lot of name calling. But uh, almost every weekend, the, the Klan was uh, burning crosses. At, I remember uh, they burned one at the Ramada Inn uh, right on the main drag of Tupelo. Um, several motels, they would just kind of take over for the weekend and have their rallies and, and burn crosses. And that kind of leads us into where we are today when we combine the events of the past that are now 
um, interject into where we are as a president, I think the most important question is how do we move forward um, as a nation, as a state, you know, as a community? And Layla, I want to ask that uh, just from the, the young person's perspective, what do you think it's going to take for us to be able to move forward? I think we need to have conversations like this. Um, I, I don't think we're ever going to get over the hump of racism, of sexism, anything until we actually start having those conversations because you can't fix a problem that people won't acknowledge. Um, and so I think, you know, conversations like what we're having right now, people to watch these conversations, people to participate in these conversations. Um, that's the first step, in my opinion. We have to yeah. talk about it, we have to acknowledge it, and we have to start understanding that when black people specifically or any marginalized group is talking about how they're oppressed, talking about how they've been taken advantage of um, in their you know, life, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're attacking the other side or the side that has historically been the oppressor. Um, it doesn't mean I'm attacking you know, Representative Clowney. It doesn't mean I'm attacking my white friends. It means I'm just telling people my experiences and people need to accept the fact that I'm a black woman. People need to accept that other people have been marginalized, other people have been oppressed, and stop taking it as if we are telling you, you did this to me. Right. I think once we get over that hump of understanding that this is systemic and systematic, then we can start having these conversations, then we can start seeing progress. And Representative Clowney, sometimes uh, racism is fixed by policy, um, or at least there in the law wise, when we look at the Civil Rights Act of 1965, or Brown uh, versus the Board of Education. Recently, uh, Governor Hutchinson has come out and shown his support for a hate crime legislation bill here in Arkansas. Um, just during your work in the legislature and, and looking at it from um, the legal standpoint, do you have any thoughts that you can share on that bill? Yeah, so um, hate crimes legislation is long overdue in our state. 47 states in the country have it. Um, for those who don't know, hate crimes legislation increases this version, the version that, that um, has been introduced in Arkansas, um, would simply increase the penalty for a crime that was committed. If that crime was committed um, to target somebody based on a number, you know, one of a number of characteristics, um, be it sex or race or religion or gender identity, sexual orientation, any of those things. Um, the bill is so important because, uh, you know, I know, I, I don't think that any legislator is naive enough to think that one piece of legislation will fix hate in our state. But I also take very, very seriously um, my responsibility as a leader, and I am grateful that the governor takes that responsibility seriously, too. As leadership for our state, it is up to us to say, this is what we will and will not accept in Arkansas. Does that mean that it will stop? No, but it means that we hope that everybody who's paying attention will hear that this is where the line is for us. This is not going to be, we are not a state that should be one of three in the country that will tolerate targeting based on any characteristics of any person. Um, and so this piece of legislation would fix that gap in our law. Um, I'm thrilled that the governor um, has expressed his support for it. It is a bipartisan piece of legislation. It has um, Republican and Democratic sponsors. Um, and I don't anticipate that, um, that Arkansas will put up a fight and say, no, we will not accept this kind of legislation that fixes this glaring problem. So I'm hopeful that, um, that we will do the right thing as soon as it is before us. Dr. Engel, as someone who is even uh, self-admitted to being a beneficiary of white privilege, and I know during your younger days, um, you had even seen some things where your father was working the day that Dr. King was assassinated and have always um, just been someone who has noticed that there is a system of racism around you. Can you kind of talk about like your experiences then to where you are now and how your mindset changed? Yeah, actually my father-in-law was uh, working downtown Memphis at uh, Lowenstein's department store uh, the day that Dr. King was assassinated. He's told me about the, the rioting that followed that and uh, just the chaos that ensued. And um, he actually took down, um, I don't know if you can read this or not, he took these yeah. signs down off of uh, 
the restrooms when um, the department store was forced to accommodate people equally. I use those signs in my classes and I would just say that part of my journey involves reading a lot of African-American writers and learning about their experiences and just a lot of conversations working with men and women over the years, learning their stories and, and finding out uh, how we're different. I would say that a lot of the people I know would not acknowledge or even believe that they have racist feelings or that they're part of a racist system or that they benefited from a racist system because uh, they just don't understand it. They haven't uh, experienced enough. They haven't talked to people outside of their own group. Uh, and so I think it is important that we talk to other people and um, hear their stories and um, kind of confront our past and think about how people like me have benefited from a, a good educational system, all sorts of opportunities uh, that uh, a lot of the people I've worked with in the past didn't have. Uh, those options. You know, I think that you are exactly correct. In order for us to move forward as a nation, as a state, as a community, we're going to have to sit down and have these conversations about race so that we can heal the divide. Thank you. It's always important to hear other voices. And one of the things that I think is pretty cool is that every activist has a story, the story that brought you to this point that made you want to speak out or stand up for the least of these. And so I'm wondering where you are right now in your journey. Uh, at what's on the horizon? What issue are you concerned about? What are you working on right now? And uh, let's start with Emma. It's really been lifelong. I mean, it started when I was at birth, I would argue, honestly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was, um, I'm adopted into a white family. And so it's like, I don't understand like the biological factors of being biracial, but but the social factors, I can understand that. Um, but when it comes to where I am right now, um, right now I'm continuing to learn how to heal from the racial trauma. Um, I'm currently on like the governor's task force and where we are as an organization right now is trying to have the difficult conversation of race and how it has a relationship um, with law enforcement and even the broader subject of the criminal justice system. Um, our good friend Jimmy Warren uh, at our recent task force meeting was talking uh, to law enforcement, to citizens alike, saying, you know, this is this task force was all created because of the protests that were happening, because of institutionalized racism, because of police brutality, because of racism in general. And so he said, we cannot keep tiptoeing around race it, it's everywhere, it's everywhere, it's in every system. It's not just in the criminal justice system, it's in educational, it's in um, economic systems, it's in housing, food, everything. And so it's having those conversations. And um, when it comes to the task force, especially right now, uh, for what we're gonna do in the future, plans in the future is we are working on reforming um, the training, uh, we're working on reforming uh, community relations, which uh, my friend Layla Holloway is currently the chair of. And we're working on um, so many different factors as to how there can be a safer, healthier relationship between law enforcement and the citizens. Uh, Irvin? In Northwest Arkansas specifically, we're confronting these programs that are anti-immigrant, uh, programs like 287G. So less than a year ago, there was three, three counties in Arkansas that had 287G active programs. And these programs are, are used to discriminate against people that look like me, specifically immigrants. And um, they were active in Washington County, in Benton County, and in Craighead County now. And there was a, a little under 50 uh, programs active throughout the entire country, and we have three of them here in Arkansas. Unfortunately, uh, a little under a year ago, we were able to get eliminated in Washington County. So it's not active there anymore, but there's still people being held at the jails uh, with federal holds from ICE. 
Um, so what we want to do is confront Benton County, confront Craighead County, and put a stop to these programs that are causing fear in our communities. There's folks who are victims, survivors of domestic abuse and other type of abuse who won't call police because they fear that if they call police, somehow they're going to find out their immigration status, they're going to end up in jail, they're going to end up at the prison in Louisiana and eventually deported and separated from their families. So these are fears that they live with every day. Some folks don't want to drive, don't want to go to the store to buy food for their families because they're scared, they're going to get stopped, they're going to get sent to jail, going to go to prison and then deported. My father was deported a few years ago and I know what the separation of family can cause and how it can affect for an entire lifetime. After my father got separated, uh, got deported, I never got to see him again because he passed away in 2010. And that type of separation from a family member is horrible um, and it causes trauma for many, many years to go. Um, so I know that when this happens to many people within Northwest Arkansas and also all around Arkansas, it can be very traumatic and it can definitely affect them for the rest of their life. And it's not fair. People deserve an opportunity to come here and thrive and hopefully get legal status so that they can be here and be uh, successful and happy uh, with their families. There's a reason why they're not in their countries of origin and a lot of it is our fault. Our country went to these countries, caused damage over there, now they're, now they're fleeing here and they're wanting to, to, to get a job. They're wanting their kids to go to college. And uh, we will confront these issues. We will make sure that people feel safe and we will do everything in our power to make sure that everyone has an equal opportunity to be successful and be happy. Kendra. My mission is to transform the criminal justice system. And what I see is there's a, there's a focus right now on policing and law enforcement, which is, is very important, but that's just one aspect of the larger criminal justice system. In fact, I think of it as a micro system. You've got policing, which is the entry level point, and then you have uh, the prosecution, the courts, the judge who uh, does the sentencing. You have the actual correctional facilities where people are housed and the conditions that they're in. And so I, I think it's important for us to examine each aspect of that system and begin to change it from simple things as just having body cameras for officers at the front end, choosing to uh, go into certain communities. You know, sometimes we can over police certain communities and then of course it leads to the pipeline. Uh, but I think also at the larger level, rethinking our entire approach. Right now our system is such that if you're the doctor and I have a headache, you give me an aspirin. But if, if Emma has a stomach ache, you give her an aspirin. If Mr. Harper has uh, chest pains, you give him an aspirin. Well, obviously, medically, that makes no sense. It's not going to work for each one of us. But we do that in criminal justice. We say, well, you have substance abuse issues, jail. You have uh, mental health issues, jail. You have trauma that you're dealing with, jail. And we, we use that. And so I think it's time for us to rethink that. I think it's important that we have representation in our justice system. Now, we know that uh, black and brown people are overrepresented on the uh, defendant side, whereas, you know, even in Arkansas, black people only make up about 15% of the population. But when it comes to the state prison population, we make up about 42%. And so on that side, we're well represented. But when it comes to the power uh, structure, the, the judges, the attorneys, the prosecutors, the police officers, we, we need that representation there as well uh, because those experiences that you bring to the job are important in, in creating equal justice. Appreciate that. We have a few more minutes remaining. I want to hear your story, Drika, where you are right now with the movement and with all of the other work that you're doing and where you're taking things from there. So I am with the group, the movement um, is composed of Tim Campbell, who's also on the governor's task force, Oyata Poet, June Young, and Darren Kidd. And I know we all have our role in this fight, and I know my role is to use my voice. God gave me a voice to use, so I'm gonna use it to continue to uplift and inspire people, because just like he said, we're not represented. Um, on the other side. I have two brothers who are incarcerated. One is in the state penitentiary, one is in federal penitentiary. And I remember going to court and the only black people that were in there was me and my brother. And I watched them sentence my brother to 20 years for an additional 20 years for a cell phone. And it really bothered me because I'm just like, you know, we need more people 
in these um, places of power to represent us so that we're not taken advantage of, you know, and unjustly sentenced. So again, I'll continue to use my voice to uplift and inspire people because again, my background is in working with at-risk youth spe specifically because I feel like they are our future. And individually, again, using my art as activism because again, I believe what we consume with our ears and eyes is very important to our personal development. So through my initiative, Quotivate, um, again, it's an initiative where you'll be able to see visuals and murals throughout the city, um, decals, posters, you'll be able to see random motivational quotes and sayings and pictures throughout the city. So it can, again, feed your subconscious mind because that's where I know I belong in this fight. Thank you, and Kendall. Just accountability and self-reflection for me, man. So on the, the professional side, accountability, uh, like the late John Lewis said, getting in good trouble, uh, I want you to know that if you're around me, I'm zero tolerance for it. Um, so you're gonna feel my stamp when it comes to that. Self-reflection is in my personal life as far as making sure that I keep myself centered, that I don't get jaded, um, that I stay motivated and positive and have these positive thoughts because change can't happen, uh, change will happen. But the deal is I just think that as long as I do my part on the inside out, because we got to work this problem on the inside out. So, so as, long as long as I do it on the inside out, the inside is professional. The out is my personal life. Um, and impact those in my world. Like I say, my small little world, just make my positive impacts and we'll be, I'll be good. So that's my, that's my journey daily. We have come to the end of our program. Thank you to our panelists and the awesome team that made this conversation possible. Young Americans want to inherit a more equitable society and young activists are doing their level best to make it so. The new generation of leaders, educators, advocates, and organizers are raising awareness, challenging the status quo, and finding ways to repair fissures that exist in our society. As young activists work to improve their communities and address systemic disparities, they seek support. There are practical solutions to the problems we face, but we must be willing to work together for the common good. I'm Dr. Malcolm Glover, and from all of us here at Arkansas PBS, thank you for watching. We hope this program has been informative and thought-provoking.